A couple of years ago, I made a TV programme called Tim McGarry's Ulster Scots Journey. People seemed to like it, though for some reason it was disgracefully overlooked for a BAFTA. Discrimination. In the programme, I examined the long and close relationship between Scotland and Ulster. And despite having what I thought was an impeccable papist background, I discovered that I had Ulster Scots ancestors just a couple of generations back. Yes, I'm proud to say that I am part Ulster Scott. That's the little part of me that hates paying for things, and the part of me that occasionally wants to do a bit of work. Well, a mere two years later, I've decided to do that bit of work. In this programme, I'm going to examine perhaps the most controversial aspect of our Ulster Scots heritage, the Ulster Scots language. Some people may have a prejudice against Ulster Scots, but it's also true that we use Ulster Scots words and phrases without even thinking about them. You're all a thriller look on the day, Tim. He's not as green as his cabbage looking. Your body's as lazy as shock water. She's a queer old cutter on her. That's like a sharp nose from like the cutter of a plow. She'd nuck the eyes out of a flute. The whole out of a flute, is that right? Is that one of them as well? That's a new one in me now. I'm a fluent speaker, as you know. Your mum's nothing but a, a thieveless packle. <laughs> you know, it paints a picture. Another clean shirt will dye him. Another clean shirt will dye him. Will dye him, will do him, it oh, means right, right. he's that ill. You know, one more clean shirt and he's ready for, for the next world. But Ulster Scots also has another problem. Many people simply don't believe that it's a language at all. They see it as merely a dialect, or just bad English, or else English with a Rabsy Nesbitt accent. Well, I would say a lot of them folk down in Ken Ochtava, but what they're talking about. I mean, that's daft. It's not English with Scots words thrown in. I mean, if you looked at it properly from our point of view, you could argue it's the same way. Ah, English is just Scots with a few English words thrown into it. And sometimes they don't even recognise it when they see it. If you saw this sign, what language would you think this is? Well, each bray Earth, it means the high hill, is the Ulster Scots version of Tullyard Way. And the reason this sign isn't hanging where it should be is because somebody thought each bray Earth was Irish. A majority of residents of Tullyard Way on the Loyalist Clonduff estate had backed the idea of having Ulster Scots signs in the first place. Many of them supported a petition organised by local man Roy Adams. Tullyard Way is an Irish name, as most of the streets around here are. And it was ironic that the people that took it down were supporting Irish then. Now, you don't need me to curry your yoghurt to know that sometimes the language in this part of the world can become, well, controversial or embroiled in our sectarian politics. Despite the best efforts of many Irish language and Ulster Scots speakers, both Irish and Ulster Scots are often seen as belonging to one side or the other. There's a perception that it only appeared in about 1998, and if it, you know, that it's A, that it's made up, or B, that it is basically Protestants getting the same amount of money as the Irish speakers get. How do you answer that? That's really infuriating, and that, uh, it, it is very uh, antagonistic for those of us who, who work in the sector. Um, you know, Ulster Scots is a form of communication. You could go to uh, a hurling match between Dunloy and Loch Gill and you'll hear some of the I finest... I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. Well, <laughs> you, you, you will hear some of the finest Ulster Scots spoken naturally. The fact is that although 99% of native speakers of Irish tend, are Catholic, uh, or certainly historically would have been Catholic, uh, the degree of homogeneity simply isn't there in the Ulster Scots community. Um, it's perhaps only two-thirds or three-quarters Protestant. There is no doubt in my view that Ulster Scots would be best served being promoted on the basis of arts rather than history or politics. Do you think more unionists are, are slightly embarrassed by that? Is there a bit of a cultural cringe about Ulster Scots? You know? the, uh, the most opposition I find uh, when I go to different events and talk about Ulster Scots, the greatest opposition comes from unionists. It is spoken very wide in a very widespread way in places which aren't Protestant. If you go up around parts of Antrim, North Antrim and round into parts of Londonderry, you'll find people who would be perceived as not Protestant speaking a beautiful, beautiful broad Ulster Scots. It's definitely not a 
divisive language. So you don't have to be a unionist to appreciate Ulster Scots? Preferably not. If you get um, beyond the political stereotype, I think that these words and expressions and these books live in the countryside um, regardless of your background, regardless of your politics or your religion. There are words that you can hear virtually everywhere. Unity in a society doesn't come from uniformity. It comes from understanding diversity. No more than that, I will say. Seamus Heaney said that from the start, the tongue of Ulster Scots was in his ear. Not literally, obviously. <laughs> that would be disgusting. So, where does Ulster Scots actually come from? I'm going to stick my neck out here and guess. Scotland? Basically, Ulster Scots is a version of the Scots language that came to Ulster in the early 17th century. But where did it all begin? I need to find out. So I'm going on a journey. Don't really want to, but it's actually a criminal offence now to make a TV documentary and not go on a journey. But I'm a homebird. I'm only going somewhere if it reminds me of Belfast. <sighs> Call this a peace wall? Hadrian's Wall was built by the Romans to keep out the barbarians to the north. 73 miles long and 15 feet high, it ran from coast to coast. Work started in 122 AD and was completed in just 14 years. To put that in perspective, that's about the same time as it takes the housing executive to fix your windies. Now, I know what you're thinking, Tim, this is all very interesting, but what's it got to do with the Scots language? Well, the Scots language, like most things in life, starts with the Romans. Because although the wall has lasted nearly 2,000 years, the Romans didn't last so long. In 410 AD, the Roman legions left Britain. It was a bit like the European referendum debate in reverse. Instead of Britain leaving Europe, Europe left Britain. Yes, we finally got rid of those Italian scroungers coming over here, building walls and roads and baths and stuff. Anyway, the point is, when the Romans left, they opened the door to a new tidal wave of immigrants. And these new ones were a lot worse. They were the English. Or, as their ancestors were known, Saxons, Jutes and Angles. Within a hundred years, they had taken over most of England from the Romans. One group carved out the kingdom of Northumbria. And they brought with them their own language. Angelish or Englisk, which originated in Denmark and the Low Countries. The truth is, there is a language and it's Northumbrian uh, in its origins. And so the Scots uh, language and to some extent the English, received English, derived from uh, Northumbria. So is Scots merely a version of English or is it a distinct language? Well, Scots language activists will tell you that Scots grew and developed apart from its sister tongue English to such an extent that a distinct language evolved. Now, as you know, I could talk to you for hours about orthography and pluricentric languages with significant asymmetric mutual intelligibility. <laughs> but I won't tell. I'll get somebody else to do that. A lot of people would say it's a dialect, it's a version of English, it's too similar to English to deserve the name uh, of, a, of a language, unlike, say, Scots Gaelic. Languages are related to one another. So Norwegian and Danish, for example, Estonian and Finnish, um, Irish and uh, Scots Gaelic. This is a norm normal thing with languages. So similarity to another language doesn't stop a language being a language. Of course it's a language. One of the reasons I think people laugh at it is that people think there's something intrinsically funny about speaking uh, a language which is indigenous to, to this country and which is part of the plantation. I presume the planter spoke Scots, but it's also the language, I presume, of the, uh, the 1798 uh, rebellion. So, you know, it's a revolutionary language, it's a radical language, and it's, it's certainly it's part of my makeup, and I say that as a miller, but also someone that's very proud of this place and proud to be an Ulster man. In the case of Scots, it's a qualified no, in that it isn't currently a language, but it may have been in the past and perhaps could be in the future if the political will were there to make it so. In the case of Ulster Scots, it's pretty much an unqualified no, uh, because regardless of the functional relationship of Ulster Scots with Standard English, structurally it will always be a form of Scots. Basque, Catalan, Flemish. 
um, Dutch, Frisian, all the minority European languages, and we tend to think of languages as belonging to a nation state, and, and it doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. The Ruthwell Cross is a masterpiece of Anglo-Saxon art dating from the 8th century. It was described as the greatest achievement of its date in the whole of Europe. The Saxons were pagans, but had been converted to Christianity by the 7th century. Apart from the magnificent carvings, what's also remarkable about this cross are the runes cut into it. These could be the oldest surviving text in early English in the entire world. What's even more surprising is that Ruthwell is in Scotland. By the 7th century, the Kingdom of Northumbria was one of the most powerful in all of Anglo-Saxon Britain, establishing itself in southeastern Scotland up as far as the Firth of Forth. Meanwhile, the Scotty, or Irish, expanded from the west into the north of Scotland, and their Irish Gaelic language quickly overcame the Pictish areas. Northumbria became a beacon of learning, with its famous monastery at Lindisfarne, which was also responsible for creating some of our most precious works of art, such as the imaginatively named Lindisfarne Gospels. Trouble was that precious things also attracted the wrong sort. Vikings. The first Viking raid on England was in 793 AD on Lindisfarne, and within a few years they had come to dominate most of Northumbria. Things changed in the year 1018 when the Battle of Carrum established King Malcolm II's rule over all of Scotland. Scotland's borders now ran to the River Tweed and the English-speaking Saxons living north of that border were now part of Scotland. But here, the Firth of Forth, or Scotswater, became the unofficial border between Gaelic-speaking Scotland and the Scots on this side of the river who spoke a Danish-influenced version of Anglo-Saxon. Trapped within a mainly Gaelic-speaking country, you'd have thought this Anglo-Saxon-speaking enclave might have soon disappeared. But it didn't. In fact, within 400 years, most Lowland Scots were speaking this new language, and the new language came to be known as Scots. So, what happened? Well, towns happened. The Scottish kings, copying their Norman counterparts to the south, started a process of urbanisation, and these new institutions, or burrs, such as Edinburgh, used Anglo-Saxon terms like craft, guild, toll, gate and wind. Soon towns like Edinburgh were trading with the Dutch, Flemish and Scandinavians, whose language had more in common with English than Gaelic. But even Gaelic words were incorporated into this evolving language, adopting words such as clan, loch, keely. The language was also influenced by Latin. And French. And so this Scottish Saxon tongue began to diverge from its southern English counterpart, and it would soon come to be known as Scots. O flower of Scotland, when will we see your like again? The Scottish kings weren't hostile to their English speaking subjects, but up until the 1300s, Gaelic was still the prestige language of Scotland. If you wanted to get on, you spoke Gaelic or French for some reason. But that all changed with the accession onto the throne of this man, Robert the Bruce. It was Robert the Bruce who finally confirmed Scotland's independence from the English. His triumph here at the Battle of Bannockburn in the year 1314 also meant the continuation of the Scots language and its separate development north of the border. Perhaps more importantly, the Scottish crown now passed to three lowland families, the Bruces, then the Balliols, and finally the Stuarts. What that meant was that in the Highlands, people continued to speak Gaelic, but the new kings were lowlanders, and their language was Scots. Those days are Scotland's capital moves south from Perth to Edinburgh, a long-standing Scots-speaking area. 
From this time in the late 1300s comes the first surviving literary text in Scots, John Barber's epic poem, The Bruce. The Bruce is so valuable, they keep it under lock and key. Imagine not trusting people from Northern Ireland. It's spelt B-R-U-S, but it's about Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce, yes. It's, it's very much about King Robert the Bruce and his struggle for power within Scotland and then his struggle for independence for Scotland as a whole. It is one of only two manuscripts of one of the earliest examples we have of substantial Scots writing, of a substantial text written in early Scots. It is already different from the English written at the time. The country was at war with England when this was written. The king had Anglophile leanings and many Scots were against that. And, and this is why things like the Bruce and also the later epic, the Wallace, became very popular again. So there's a nationalist chew to it. It's about mm -hmm. Bannockburn and it's about yeah, uniting right. Scotland and it's about driving the English mm -hmm. out. There's certainly that feel to it. Yes, oh, definitely. Yes. Uh, if I was to, you know, put this under my arm and, you know, just leave the library and, and not come, what, what would the fine be per day for this? <laughs> I don't know if you could put it like this. You, you might lose your liberty. <laughs> right, like that. You hear that? <laughs> By the late 14th and early 15th century, Scots had supplanted Gaelic and French to become the language of the royal court. In 1424, King James I of Scotland wrote the King's Quare, the King's Book, and he wrote it in Scots. It was in Scotland, of course, the language of the court. In early modern Scotland, uh, the saying was you spoke Scots to your king, French to your lady, and Gaelic to your god. <laughs> English didn't get a look at it. <laughs> It was in the late Renaissance that Scots language enthusiasts believe that written Scots reached its literary high water mark. There was an explosion of creative activity with Stirling Castle at its epicentre. Stirling Castle was the favoured hangout of the Stuarts. Writers such as Robert Henderson, William Dunbar, Gavin Douglas, and David Lindsay, through to Alexander Montgomery, made a group of outstanding writers who are known collectively as the Makars. The Makars were sort of court poets to the Scottish court of the 15th and early 16th century. The Makars brought Scots poetry to new heights, drawing on such influences as Dante and Chaucer. Sadly, however, much of their work was later lost or destroyed. One of the greatest of these Makars was Blind Harry, who wrote the Wallace, which takes as its subject that other hero of Scottish independence, William Wallace. And a bit like Mel Gibson's film, it's a wee bit inaccurate. But also like Mel's film, it was hugely popular and it elevated Wallace to the status of national martyr. And as we've seen, John Barber's The Bruce glorified the struggles of Robert the Bruce. So it's clear to see that the early writers and Scots identified themselves closely with the cause of Scottish freedom. There's a slight irony here in that Ulster Scots is perceived to come from a unionist, people from a unionist background. Over here is Scots part of the nationalist revival. If you found somebody in Scotland who was hostile to the Scots language, who, who regarded it as a, either as a historical anomaly or an artificial creation, they would probably be of a unionist disposition. There are people who are quite capable of seeing the cultural argument for Scots, the, the, the existential argument for Scots, and but denying along with the desire for independence. To folk like me, that doesn't make sense. I mean, the only way to save the Scots language is to be independent and to be proud of it. And I don't see how we can be proud of ourselves if we're not proud of ourselves, <laughs> to put it that way. Let me put the unionist argument then, which is that this is uh, this cultural separatism. This is a part of saying we're different from England. We deserve to be separate because we're culturally separate. Is it? Now, Scotland doesn't have to validate a national identity. It's one of the strongest national identities in the world. I mean, if, if the question of Scottish politics is, is Scotland a nation? then you get 98% people saying yes. And you don't have to be a Scottish nationalist to, to believe in nourishing and flourishing a Scottish culture and Scottish language. Uh, but it would be the case, I suspect, that most Scottish nationalists would think that was a good idea. The Makar period is said to have reached its pinnacle with Gavin Douglas's Ian Eidos, his version of Virgil's Aeneid, the first translation of an ancient text into an Anglic language. And it was published in the year 1513. 
But that year was also a disastrous year for Scotland and the start of the decline of the Scots language. In 1513, a Scottish army invaded England to aid France, which was being attacked by Henry VIII. Despite being outnumbered, the English annihilated the Scottish army. King James IV died on the battlefield. He was the last monarch in the British Isles to do so. The power vacuum in Scotland led to massive political instability, which the Tudor monarchs were only too happy to exploit. And then along came the Reformation. In 1560, encouraged by Protestant England, and spurred by the fiery preaching of John Knox, the Church of Scotland broke with the Church of Rome. Parliament abolished the Catholic Mass, and the country officially became Calvinist. Scotland, now newly Calvinist, needed a Bible. There was no approved Scots version, so the Scottish Calvinists used an English translation, the Geneva Bible. The preachers probably had to paraphrase it into Scots so that their congregations could understand why they would soon be cast into the fiery depths of hell. But the text was in English. This lays claim to being the house where John Knox lived. Wouldn't have been much crack living with John Knox, would it? Apparently, Knox's daughter committed the terrible sin of coming down late for breakfast one morning. Knox pointed an accusing finger at her and shouted, Spawn of the devil! To which she replied, Good morning, father. Yes, fun-loving and easy-going aren't exactly phrases we associate with 16th century Scottish Protestantism. It was all a bit stern and hostile to artistic works. Now, most Scots literature at the time tended to be Catholic in content and artistic in nature, which is why Knox described the Scots language as the language of popery. Mind you, you'd have thought that John Knox would have ended up somewhere better than this. I mean, buried in a car park? <laughs> but it wasn't all one-way traffic. I mean, what did you do when you were 17? King James VI of Scotland wrote a book called Rulus and Cautless. Rules and Cautions. Basically a guide to writing poetry in Scots. Mind you, he was a king. <laughs> Probably got somebody to write it for him. But when King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England and Scotland, he issued the new King James Bible, which was, of course, in English. The key thing was the Union Accounts, because it, it moved the, the court from Scotland, where Scots was uh, spoken, uh, to London, where English w was spoken. Although the early court commentators of uh, James I, as he became uh, James VI to Scotland, were the, complaining about they couldn't understand <laughs> the Scots courtiers who'd come, down to, who'd come down to London. So obviously that was a crucial thing. Yes, the royal court was now in London and its language was English. Scots quickly became displaced as the language of government and commerce and literature. In our neck of the woods, James is probably most famous for the plantation. Scots settlers poured into Ulster. But the indigenous population would also affect how the Scots language developed in Ulster. Ulster was the most Gaelic part of Ireland, so there was an awful lot of Gaelic still spoken here at that time. And that was going to absorb into the everyday parlance of the people that came here. Also, you had existing Elizabethan English and sort of hangovers of Norman French as well. So all these things go into a melting pot. And a lot of these different words and phrases have sort of got absorbed to make Ulster Scots subtly different in pronunciation and vocabulary from modern-day Scots in different parts of Scotland. So there are bits of Irish in there as well? Aye. But if I said tell your whist, whist or whist is from a, a, a Gaelic derivative. And also I was into the clabber. Well, clabber is from the Irish clabar for mud. And that has been absorbed into Ulster Scots terminology. There's a rule in local TV. If you're making a documentary about history, culture, art or literature, well, you'll end up in the Lindenhall Library, even if you don't want to. And the reason is simple. The Linen Hall has everything. Where's the largest collection of Ulster Scots literature? No, it's not a trick question. It's here. Scots language literature was being printed in Belfast and was being imported during the 1600s and 1700s. The 17th century in Ulster 
was a, a, a turbulent time for those settlers. There's a lot of instability, so there isn't as much written material available. There's the Ulster Miscellany. It contains a whole variety of poems and prose and riddles and verse and different things, nearly all anonymous, but at the back of it there are nine poems which have come to be called the Scotch Poems from Donegal. By the end of the 17th century, it was clear that Scots was under pressure. In Scotland, Scots was commonly spoken by 70% of the non-Gallic-speaking population. However, the written and printed word was almost universally in English. On the 1st of May in the year 1707, in this very hall, the Scots Parliament voted itself out of existence and instead joined with England and Wales to form the United Kingdom. Parliament was now in London. From the very outset, the new Scottish MPs were mocked by their English counterparts for their use of the Scots language. 300 years on, and Alex Salmond has exacted a little revenge. In House Commons, you're not allowed to insult somebody personally. So if you called somebody a thieving, slimy rogue, you'd be upbraided by the speaker immediately. If you call him a sleek at scunner, <laughs> then it has two great virtues. Firstly, you get off with it in terms of, uh, in terms of parliamentary protocol. And secondly, it also has a great virtue that the minister concerned knows he's being insulted. He's just not quite sure to what extent. The English translation of Sleek It's Gunner would be a slimy emetic, you know, a walking emetic. And the Hansard writers would send me down a note saying, you know, what is Sleek It? Uh, and I'd, you know, put slimy, untrustworthy. What is Scunner? You know, sick making, you know, odious, <laughs> and send it back up again. You know, so they had the translation and they'd put Scotch usage. <laughs> you see? One expert in the Scots language writing about the significance of 1707 stated that to the extent that Scots is a provincial dialect, it only became so once Scotland began to think of itself as a province rather than a nation. After 1707, the Scottish elite turned to English. In 1754, the Select Society, sounds a bit like the Bullingdon Club, was formed in Edinburgh to promote the use of English. Many at the head of the Scottish Enlightenment, such as David Hume and Adam Smith, sought to eradicate the use of Scots from their writing. Books were written designed to correct improprieties of Scots speech and writing. These efforts drove Scots away from its position as a national language. But the language clung on. It continued to be spoken and written in regional varieties in large parts of the country, but it was clearly under pressure. What I love about Northern Ireland is that there will be people watching this at home thinking, Hmm, a fella from Sinn Féin and Alex Salmond support the Ulster Scots? Damn, I'm going to have to pretend I like it now. And there'll be other people thinking, Hmm, a fella from Sinn Féin and Alex Salmond? That has put me off me Ulster Scots. But take the politics out of it. You've got to admit that Scots has legitimate linguistic roots and a literature going back seven centuries to the Bruce. In the second part of Minding Our Language, we'll take a close look at the Scots and Ulster Scots literature, and we'll find out why Bally Carey needs an airport, and how Money Ray predated Ashley Madison. And yes, you can see that next Sunday night at nine o'clock. Film time next tonight, though. Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt star in the rather forward-thinking thriller Looper.